Good day, everybody, and this is Mike Hidner with Historic Point Boss Update, and to my right is Joel Greco, one of our citizens and also a board member of Historic Point Boss. Welcome, Joel. Thank you. And we're going to talk a little bit about Joe and his character and everything like that, and he usually portrays uh, early uh, citizen of Point Boss, but he probably precedes it realistically probably by about 100 years or so, but... Uh, he, he's out here in the cabin with the school groups, or he might be just outside of the cabin, camped and everything. But we're going to talk a little bit about with Joe how he got started in it and what he's done over the years. Because, Joe, you go back probably 40, 50 years when you started first. Right. Well, actually, when I was, uh, I, I grew up in, on the south side of Chicago, and I mm -hmm. always did a lot, since I was five years old, hunting and fishing with my dad and my grandfather. And I was always interested in history. And what really got me going was uh, in grammar school, the nuns talking about the Jesuit uh, martyrs and uh, Father Marquette, mm -hmm. Louis, jo Louis Joliet, and things like that. And then, uh, oh, in the early 70s, I, yeah, I got into uh, uh, living history and historical reenactments all over uh, the United States and different uh, places in Canada. Uh, Currently, I belong to the North American Voyager Conference, the uh, Coalition of Historical Trekkers, the uh, Historical Reenactors Guild of Wisconsin, and some other ones also. Mm -hmm. And I've been fortunate enough over the years to uh, uh, view the archives and artifacts at uh, different main French posts, like Fort Wyatnon, which is on the Wabash River in uh, Lafayette, Indiana, Fort Michelin-Mackinac, and uh, Old Fort William, Grand Portage, and it, it's really what, I viewed the, the artifacts the first time at uh, Fort Wyatnon probably 30 years ago, mm -hmm. and what r really amazed me was the amount of what are called sleeve buttons, which are the predecessors of uh, uh, the modern day cufflink. Um, <clears throat> also at Grand Portage, uh, there, they found uh, two Jesuit rings that were tied together, and they figured those were used as a sleeve button also. Um, so, for a while now, I converted all my shirts to sleeve thread buttons, buttons and uh, the sleeve buttons. buttons. And the advantage of that is... The sleeve buttons can be taken off one shirt and put on another one. And your thread buttons, which mm -hmm. are made of thread, uh, don't break. And they can uh, uh, survive the heavy scrubbing and that of the laundress who would come in. Now, you can imagine the laundry in those days was much rougher on their clothes than what we think of today. De definitely. And, and, I, and I can see even with my buttons, you know, the shell buttons and everything, they're cracking and breaking even with modern laundry. Exactly. And, you know, from the beginning of the time, there were all kind of different types of buttons and closures that closed up your shirts or coats or uh, your breeches and things like that. Um, <clears throat> actually, in uh, 1622, in Dorset, England, the thread buttons started to become a, um, a cottage industry, okay? So they were made in the cottages, and then they were distributed throughout uh, Europe and everywhere else. And uh, <clears throat> then when we get into the early uh, 19th century, the sleeve, these actually were on the collars of shirts, and they uh, showed up on the, uh, the clothes of sleeves, too. And you can see this, this shirt here is an 18th century shirt. And the back of the shirt is actually longer than the front of the shirt. Because this was actually considered an undergarment, okay? So this would have been tucked underneath your, and used as underwear also. Because when you travel, you have to take everything with you. Exactly. And uh, so this is an example of an 18th century shirt. Uh, on, the, on the cuffs, uh, one that I examined from a museum on the cuffs, you can't hardly see it here, but there's little uh, knots all the way along here. They're called uh, French knots, 
And those were put on here in order to uh, strengthen the edge of this cuff so it wouldn't wear out as fast. And if you also notice, this cuff is only about three quarters of an inch wide. Mm -hmm. And that's an earlier shirt would have had that. The same thing with the collar. Would have been a stand-up collar like this, and it has two uh, thread buttons on it. Also, buttons were covered buttons, okay? So this, um, your uh, civilian clothes would have had, a lot of them would have had covered so buttons. So they're self-covered in the same fabric as the whatever is a vest in this Ex case? Exactly. Well, this is called a gillet. This is, is actually... Is different than a waistcoat? This is what I have on as a waistcoat West now. And it's, it's an early one because you can see how long it is. And this particular one has uh, uh, wooden buttons on it. Mm -hmm. Uh, this one here would have been worn when it was cold out over your undergarment, your shirt, as like a, what we would use now as a, a insulated uh, underwear or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And that's wool, Joe? That's wool. Cool. Just about everything is wool, okay, mm -hmm. other than the shirt. Uh, this, this one here, this galet here, is closed up which with what are called a uh, hook and eye, all right? So these were made out of brass. These would... Uh, and, and still, Joe, in, in today's age, still use. Yes, they do, because I remember my grandmother having these in her sewing kit, mm -hmm. and I would play with them and call them little frogs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is another example of a different type of galet. Uh, this is my sewing box. Here's something that I carry with me uh, like when I'm going on a, a scout or I, I'm out for a while. Traveling kit. It's a, called a housewife. Okay. Okay. This uh, contains all I need to sew stuff up. Uh, and one interesting thing in here, well, backtracking a little bit, my, my grandfather was a tailor from Italy. And lucky for me, none of my uh, siblings or uh, cousins wanted any of his stuff. So I inherited his uh, uh, Singer Threadle sewing machine and all of his sewing stuff, mm -hmm. his scissors and, and things like that. Now, this is called uh, Taylor's Thimble. You can see it's open at both ends. Now, tailors use this open thimble like this. They also used the closed top one. The reason for the open top in it, this, your fingertip kind of steps, sticks out of it. So that, that uh, eliminates condensation building up in here. And also the tailor's using all his fingers so they could grab the fabric easier and use that. Joe, would they have those tailor thimbles on more than one finger possibly when they're working? No, I've just seen it on one. one finger. And, the, and the, the deal with using a thimble Actually, I should put it on this finger. Is you push, you got your needle, you push it through the fabric with a thimble, and as it comes out, you grab it with your other two fingers and pull it through. And once you become really coordinated, you can just go right along with that. Mm -hmm. And that was another thing on the shirts, museum shirts that I uh, inspected. The stitching on that was so fine that it, it mimicked a sewing machine, what a sewing machine could mm. do. Uh, the military shirts, the soldiers usually had about, were issued uh, four to six shirts. And uh, the military, a, a, let me, a tailor would be the person mainly who made the patterns and cut them out. Then the seamstress would be the ones that sewed it up. So they would hire usually about three women and in a week, they could make sew up, hand sew up, uh, 24 shirts, mm. which is amazing. But anyway, uh, this is my little sewing kit. I've got some thread buttons in here. And, and the thing is, wh what's nice about the thread buttons, they're not going to break. You could carry some thread with you and make them as you, as you go or as you need them. I've got a, a case here that I keep my needles in. And then I've got uh, like a thread winder where I've got extra thread. I've got some beeswax in here. I also have uh, some pieces of uh, cloth that I 
could use to uh, patch, patch stuff up. Mm -hmm. And you can see how this is very handy and comp compact to uh, carry with you. Uh, so that would have been a necessity for the average person because they're going to do their repairs on the on the on the on the fly, so to speak. They're exactly. Not, they're, exactly. You're not going to have a possibility of running into a tailor or a seamstress somewhere. You might, but you probably might not. Elves in the wilderness, especially. Here's some examples of uh, sleeve buttons, and uh, they could tell where they came from by the designs on them, mm -hmm. and date them that way, like Fort Wyatnon, 1715. Uh, Michelin Mackinaws, they're early 1700s, and uh, when you get over to Grand Portage, that's where Northwest Company was, so that's, you know, 18, early 1800s. Uh, here is the example. These are, are copies of the Jesuit rings that were found at Grand Portage and how they were just sewed together, and then you, these would have been used, could have been used for uh, sleeve buttons also. And then once again, here's the sample of uh, the brass hook and eye. So, and they, these had a specific way that they went on. Uh, and uh, these held together real nice also. And it typically be brass in those days because that was a metal of choice or maybe one right. of the few metals of choice. Well, the, when you get to the military, the buttons would have been uh, uh, made in a button mold. This one's made of uh, pewter. Mm -hmm. uh, these are metal ones. Uh, of course, these rings, brass ones. So and the military, Joe, would less likely have thread buttons than the civilians? Yeah, they would, they would have what's used uh, called with brass buttons. Brass okay, buttons. and what's interesting that I saw also is there's a couple of different ways that these brass buttons were attached to uh, your sleeveless waistcoat or your sleeved waistcoat. One of the ways was they were sewn on, but a lot of them were put on this way. They have a shank on the back, so they were pushed through a, a, with, with an awl. You'd make a hole through your fabric. They were pushed through there and then a uh, piece of leather like this mm -hmm. was threaded through all the shanks. And by doing that, you could pull this out, remove the buttons, you know, remove the buttons, uh, either and replace them. And use it on some other outfit. Or, you know, to clean these. Clean, so you could clean those brass buttons so that... Uh. Another way... Another way that they were attached was uh, with uh, split rings. Okay, so they that would hold them in individually, and they could be taken off the, with the taking the split ring off. Uh, while they were on the garment, this is called uh, a button stick. This would go underneath the buttons slide under the buttons like so. So now you've got the buttons like that and the majority of your cloth is behind this button stick. So then uh, a rough piece of wool was taken and uh, things like brick dust, uh, what's called whiting, which is like a chalk substance, mm -hmm. and even ashes from your fire were used. Put on this rough uh, wool cloth and these were polished up and, and shined up. And that protected the cloth at the same time. Right. And, uh, you know, those of us that have been in the military, you know, your brass always, I mean, had to be shined up. And mm -hmm. that's what kept these nice and clean. So this was also carried. Uh, and I've got different, I've got another thing in my sewing kit here. I've got like a, a place I could put needles and pins while I'm using them. I also have what's called a, a needle booklet or case. And this is just pieces of wool. Different types and sizes of needles were just put in here. And uh, Were needles expensive, do you know, Joe? Well, uh, there's, there's uh, 
they they show up in so many uh, trade lists and that I mean by the hundreds mm -hmm. and basically they're almost a similar now there were forged ones and things like that but they had a bigger eye on them and but uh, other ones are uh, similar to what's around now and that, like I said that would be a good idea even today because it, it's always so hard to Keep your needles nice. Yeah. Uh, well, you can keep them a little bit categorized. Well, you know what? I don't throw anything away. <laughs> you know, so I've got scraps of wool, so and uh, you, you know, here it, it make use of it. This is this here is a uh, uh, salvaged end uh, uh, cloth. There's a certain way of making this uh, breech clouts and in, in different uh, earlier style uh, leggings, and that were made with wool like this. It's almost like the modern tide dyeing uh, mm -hmm. procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the other things I have are different types of uh, scissors and uh, awls. Can you demonstrate the, the different scissors? And yes. Okay. This is more like a fine embroidery type of scissor. And this is a, a, a copied shape that they would have been. Uh, one of the most treasured things that I have and I believe it or not uh, while I was working at the phone company I was walking we were repairing a cable and I was while I was walking down the alley these were laying right in the middle of the alley and when I first picked them up they looked like uh, little kids scissors yeah ones I don't well hurt. when you look real close at, at these these are hand forged you can see the pin in the center is hand forged and these uh, basically like snake heads on here. I, I brought this over to uh, Grand Portage and showed them this, and it, uh, it's actually an 18th century uh, pair of uh, snips. Okay. So these are originals. That's quite a find. Yeah. Uh, and luckily you knew the difference, or at least you, you'd stuck Well, you know what? I found them in the middle of the alley. If I would have found them in somebody's yard, I'd have knocked on their door and told them what it was, right. and, you know, if they wanted to sell them, fine. But in the middle of the alley... Anybody's. I'm not. I'm not gonna worry about that. Do you know where they were made? Because I just recently watched a, a video on on a very expensive tailor scissor maker in England. They're like the last people that make them, and each one is made by hand. And and uh, do you know? I to be honest with you, I don't recall uh, exactly where they were made. But there's a book called uh, Diderot's Encyclopedia, and it has all kind of stuff in there, you know, and these appeared in, in there also. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Then there's a, here's a couple different types of awls that were used to pull coals and leather. Uh, there's another type. Joel, you have a... Why, why do you think they offset that like that? Well, some of them were offset and some were actually straight. The offset ones kind of stopped when you were putting it into a oh, handle. Okay. Okay. okay? And sure. and the the ones that were straight, a lot of those show up, but they're pretty difficult to use without poking you yourself. So, you know. Yeah. Uh, Joe, you think gonna, you, you have a, a quite an interest in in uh, in the sewing and everything because of your grandfather? Is that I'd like a to, little I, bit? I like to think that. I yeah. mean, I've sewn, hand-sewed a bunch of my stuff. Yeah, uh, so maybe that's some of your of your grandfather's heritage coming through. Yeah. Um, these are other... Well, here's another thing. This is what a period uh, seam ripper looked like. So one end of it has a little pointed awl on it, and the other end is a seam ripper. So if you had to rip the seams out, you just went along with this. Uh, what else do I got in here? I thought I had... Oh, okay. Here's another little neat thing. Okay, this was used to cut a buttonhole in a, in a uh, garment that you were going to make. So it's like a, a buttonhole chisel. Use it with a hammer of some sort? Yeah. You'd hit this, you'd place this on wherever you're going to uh, make the buttonhole, and pound it in there, and it would cut the cloth.
Uh, you think they had them in various widths? Depending yes, on they, they definitely. They came in different widths depending on what uh, you were sewing up. Uh, some of the stuff, like on military, the buttonhole was twice as long as the button, but part of it was completely sewn shut, so it was just decorative. But these came in different shapes. Uh, some of the more uh, fancier ones had like a, a wooden handle on them, like a chisel would have. Mm -hmm. So these are called a buttonhole uh, chisel. Do you know why the military did that, where, where they had a longer buttonhole and sold part of a chisel? Decoration. Did, did all that work just for decoration? Yeah, wow. like like a lot of uh, a lot of these uh, West kits, uh, they had a fake pocket. They didn't actually have a pocket. They just put a flap and a button on right. it. Right. Uh, you were actually considered undressed if you didn't have this Best this west uh, sleeveless waistcoat on it. Yeah. Of course, if you were working in a field or whatever, then you you took that off. Same thing, being outside, you always had your head covered, whether it be with a toque like I have on or a cloth. There's different cloth ones that are used. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Okay, here's another thing called a bodkin. There's oh, various, I've heard that name before. Mm -hmm. there's, there's different ones that I have in here, uh, different sizes. These were used like uh, to poke holes also, like the metal awl. They were also used to make, as a uh, form to make uh, the thread buttons, which we're going to do. And uh, yeah, there's, diff there's different kinds in here. In shapes. Would they have been made, Joe, at one time, I suppose, for uh, really decorative and fancy purposes or something wealthy, maybe out of ivory? Yeah, definitely. Probably. A lot of stuff was made out of ivory. These were made out of bone. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's different types of scissors. Uh, of course, I don't have the big cloth cut, cover, cutting ones in here. Uh, I, do, I did inherit those from my grandfather, and they're just unbelievable. I wish that uh, I would have... Uh, he passed away before I really got into this, long before that. I wish I could have picked his mind more so on, on with, some With what you know now, it would have been really right. advantageous to have such a resource like that. Right. Because I'm sure they did the same thing for hundreds of years. Yeah, and uh, these buttons... One of the ways to cover them is you get a piece of cloth, the same as the uh, 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 what you're uh, going to put the buttons onto, and then you cut cut a circle twice the size of the button itself. And then what was done was a running stitch was put all the way around this, and, uh, and I can do that. Would someone in that time period have that many needles? Oh yeah, like I said, there's especially the tailor, and also what the tailor had, which is uh, called a tailor's goose, and that is actually similar to the flat irons we have in the house. Okay, oh, okay. only it was all one piece of metal, so that mm -hmm. was a tailor's goose, and they had a block of wood that was rounded on the top and then flat on the bottom, and that was a, a seam block. Okay, so uh, well, what they would do is basically woolen, uh, woolen uh, garments were uh, ironed with the sailor's uh, or the tailor's goose. Okay, but not the the top side. It was the reverse side that was ironed because you didn't want if you did it on the top side, it would eventually turn shiny. Oh, okay. And what they what they did is they took a piece of also took a piece of muslin and wetted it, and that was called a sponge. And they would wrap the wool up in that that they were gonna uh, press, mm -hmm. and that would be uh, left overnight. And then the next day, that wet piece of muslin was taken off, and they would uh, uh, press it on the on the inside. And that's where you get the word pressing, is oh. from the sailor's goose or the tailor's goose. And the flat irons, they're mm -hmm. actually pressing that down. The seam 
uh, block smoother would then rub be rubbed against it and would would uh, flatten the seams. Same thing as what a sailor would use for uh, when he was making sails. They had a seam rubber there that would uh, rub the seams uh, smooth. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, when any of the sewing that was done, uh, the thread was always waxed. And by doing that, it, uh, it lasted probably more than twice as long. And so you wax it yourself? You would wax it yourself. You just pull it against some beeswax, is that it? Yeah. I, ju I just got a, a block of uh, wax there. And... Uh, Does it make it a little easier to use because it's stiffer, Joe? Do you think? Yeah. Part of that? And especially when making these, uh, the thread buttons, mm -hmm. you want that to be pretty heavily waxed. Hope I can, hope I can thread this needle. Here by the light. You want you want it hev heavily waxed, and I'll show you why. Because it, it's it sticks together then, and would last. Or is easier to hold its shape and not to crush. I get it? No, not yet. There we go, I think. <laughs> Let me cut this a little bit smoother. That works the same way, Joe, as I remember helping my mother so when I was younger I used to wet it with your with your saliva and then make it stiffer so that you could get it through the eye. So Yeah, that's what that's what I did with my grandmother. We didn't really Looks like the eye is not quite big enough. No, that's pretty big. It's a little bit coincidental, Joe, that my my grandfather was a tailor from Germany, and his brother was a cobbler when they came over. Oh, wow. One was a tailor and one was a cobbler. They learned the old world trades, and they could do the same thing in, of course, the United States when they settled. Tailors, it's pretty funny because uh, tailors belong to a real strong, what we call union now, a guild. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what I like to do, too. I usually take my needle and spin it around like this so then that wax thread kind of holds itself together so what I'm gonna do is just do like a running stitch all the way around here Yeah, it's really cool. I have, uh, like I said, my all my grandfather's needles, his scissors, and there's actually uh, um, his thread. Thread's still halfway decent wow. also. Now, did he just do men's tailoring, or did he do women's also? Uh, all I remember, I ma mainly men. Men? He worked at different uh, uh, well, shops, clothing stores. Okay, so I think I have a button in here. There's one in here somewhere. It's in here. I should have taken it out earlier. Anyway, so this would just kind of go over to your metal button, then these two ends, I wish I would have found that button, but 
that poodle button was in your other sewing kit. Yeah, but the, I'm looking for this. This was made out off the top of uh, one of these brass ones. Oh, bigger, bigger button. Okay, so that actually would go around a button like that. You'd pull this, and then you'd go back and forth in between the, the pleats in here mm -hmm. and then stitch it shut, and, you know, that's what you would end up with with this. So... Is there like any, any special style, Joe, that they use the covered buttons, the cloth covered buttons with, versus something else? Was it more stylish or fancier? Or? The cloth covered ones, you can see, uh, like on my uh, gillet, one gillet there is just plain. Mm -hmm. uh, there were different types of buttons that were fancier. They're called death head buttons, and uh, they're made different uh, in the... Uh, fact that they had different designs on them and stuff like that and they basically had uh i've not tried to do that yet uh they had like a wooden base with a hole in the center and then you just go back and forth at different angles and that made like a design on there and then you came back down and you uh made like a a, a shank on there to fasten those buttons to whatever you were doing uh, cloth you were doing okay now to get into making this uh, thread button. What you need to make a thread button, you need your beeswax, scissors, uh, your thread of course, linen thread, heavier than uh, the, the thread that was used to actually make the shirt, and what's called uh, a button stick. Okay, at first I thought, okay, the farther back you bring it, the bigger the button it's made. Well, what, what's done is you put your thread on the button. And you start approximately like in that spot there. Okay, so then we're going to go around about 30 times. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight. I'm not going to go around 30 times because I won't have enough thread on here. But you go around about 30 times. Now, you want to make sure you don't go to the complete end of this button stick because this is what the eye of the button is going to come out to. Now, you gently take that off, and then, like I said, because it's heavily beeswax, you want to press down on it. And you can insert this again to kind of keep that opening. Okay, then what I'm going to do is gotta, I'm going to do a buttonhole stitch around the whole button. Okay, now you, you want to hold this thread like this. You don't want to hold it this way because you'll crush it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up the bottom of the hole, and then I move to my, my needles here, and I'm going to bring my thread around clockwise. Now when I'm pulling this, you can see I'm making a knot. All right? So that's I'm going to have a series of knots around the whole outside of this uh button that I'm making. If it starts to get out of shape, you can just play around with it and reshape it. And those can be made any size, Joe, depending on what you have the use for it or the application? Right. The thicker, the more you wrap it around, the thicker it's going to be. Mm -hmm. When, and I, you want to really pull tight on this thread. So... Just less than breaking it. Is the linen thread fairly strong on its own? Depends what how big you get it. But linen thread, yeah. 
is strong on its own. It's more than cotton. Yeah, I think. And that's, what, like I said, that's what, it, it's made even stronger when you uh, wax it. So anytime you're sewing a garment and uh, you want to wax your thread, And there's uh, and the reason we know that they these were used on shirts. In uh, I believe it's like 1776, a criminal was arrested for stealing 12 dozen uh, thread buttons used for shirts. Went to court in uh, uh, England. So you had the court proceedings to right. And then there was another another criminal who, and this is unbelievable, actually stole 3,400 in some thread buttons. So uh, in, in the th uh, one of the other things with thread buttons is that they're uh, less ex expensive, of course, than metal ones or bone ones. Uh, I also was at a site where a guy gave a talk on uh, shell buttons. And what would be done was, uh, they had a thing that kind of looked like a four-pronged uh, anchor, more or less, but it was made out of heavy wire. And it had a loop on the top, and that was tied to a, a, a cordage. And at night, the clams open up. And they knew where the clam beds were at. They would go along and drop numerous of these in there. When they'd hit that open clam, it would close up. It wouldn't hook them like a fish hook. Mm -hmm. That clam would uh, close up, and they could pull it out. Pull it out, and uh, then sent to a, a button factory. A button factory. Mm -hmm. And uh, how many knots do you make on there, Joe? Is that a variable thing, or is that uh... you go completely around once? Wrong ones. Okay. When you get when you get to the end, mm -hmm. actually this is kind of a sloppy one, but you get the gist of it. When you get to the end of where you started, you can either uh no I'm Now this, like I told you before, this is all knots that went around this button. So you can cut this right off here, and, uh, it's, not gonna and it's, it's not going to. Now if you want to shank on it, I'm going to go through this again. But anyway, where's that one? Okay. If you want to shank on the button, you'd go back and forth underneath a couple of threads three or four times. And then... You would stick your needle underneath here, and you would do a buttonhole stitch all along that. That creates your shank. And you could cut this off. I like leaving leaving some of this on there because now when I go to sew this on, I've got my, uh, a piece of thread, thread that I could sew it onto, whatever. Right there with it. Now, you can feel how stiff that is. You can't bend that. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it, it really works well. This one's made out of linen thread. Uh, this is another type of linen thread that's a little bit heavier. This seems to be stronger. And uh, so that's basically what uh, a covered button, what you would do, and what a, a thread button would actually look like. Uh, once I started making these, it came like an obsession. Mm -hmm. And I had, I don't know how many in here. I just kept making them. I made them out of uh, 
different color linen thread uh, to match uh, whatever garment I had. But the majority of them, <clears throat> like I said, are just uh, the plain linen ones. <coughs> Excuse me. So you figure maybe it'll take five minutes to make one, Joe? Probably average, depending yeah. on the size or whatever? Yeah, the proper light and everything. I mean, realistically, if you were in a cabin like this, you were you were working with candlelight, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, <clears throat> and you could also use, you could add, also use uh, that's kind of a sloppy one. Well, you can give, you can, uh, you can you also can give people use, hope that you know you don't have bodkins. to be that you don't have to be that great to begin with, right? Right, and I mean once you keep doing it, you can get faster and and really take your time and everything spaced out just right, mm -hmm. and your knots all line up, you know, and it's they're in like a straight line. Uh, some of the uh, historical vendors sell these. They sell them for like anywhere from a buck to a buck fifty a piece. So, but they're not hard that make to make. Uh, and this stuff here isn't really that hard to acquire. Like I said, my pin cushion. Uh, actually, this one was made out of uh, one of those uh, uh, things that go around drapes, mm. <laughs> and then. Uh, some a few years back uh somebody had uh lamb's wool out here just rough lamb's wool mm -hmm. wool so it still had the lanolin and stuff like that in it and that's what you really want to make your uh your uh needle uh thing like this out of because th what that does is when you push your needle in there uh you have that lamb's wool in there with the lanolin and it'll keep your needles from rusting yeah it probably oils it right so, uh, that's, any more questions or? No, I think you covered it really good, Joe. You, do you want to, I think since we're here and you're here especially, why don't you mention your fall event that you have here at Historic Yes, uh, the weekend of uh, the 8th of uh, October, uh, the Historical Reenactors Guild of Wisconsin, a bunch of us are coming out here and, and setting up uh, we also have, uh, I understand, 60-some school kids coming through on that Friday the 8th. Uh, it'll be uh, that weekend. It's free. Uh, you'll have uh, reenactors from all over the place doing, everybody's doing something different. Well, you suggest uh, for our public out here that since you have school, group, school groups Friday afternoon, that probably that. Saturday or Sunday? That Saturday be would be, Saturday and Sunday would probably be the best time. Uh, I would say between uh, 10 o'clock on Saturday to 5 o'clock and then Sunday. Uh, we're usually here till about uh, 4 o'clock or so, yeah. depending on how the weather is. Right. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you can come out for that. Uh, and, and we don't... enjoy with the school kids coming out. Now, Hopefully, with all this new stuff going around, the that's still going to yeah. happen. Yeah. Uh, right now, I just checked with uh, Ken and Doreen, Archie, and uh, everything's still a go. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. we're looking forward to it. Yeah, Joe, yeah. we have quite a bit of time left. Would you mind kind of uh, um, reliving the experience of uh, opening up the rebuilding of Grand Portage in your, in your role in that and your son? Uh, or if you uh, I wasn't to, involved in the rebuilding of it. But I mean, you were at that the, the opening ceremony, right? The, yeah, we uh, they redid actually they redid the stockade around there, and uh, at one of the events, which is usually uh, right around this time in August, but the last two years it's been canceled. Uh, same thing with Madeline Island. Uh, we go up there and in the stockade there, and. Uh, all my kids have come with me uh, since they were, well, my son was four or five, the first one he went to. We usually went, when I lived in Illinois, I usually went to, uh, participated at Fort Wyatnon. It's called the Feast of the Hunter's Moon, and it's the same weekend this year as we're having our uh, event here for uh, Historical Reenactors Guild. And they actually get, on a nice weekend, they'll get sixty to 70,000 people coming oh. through here. With three days of schools, with thousands of school kids coming through, 
So everybody's excited this year because so far, knock on wood, it is going to happen. Uh, and where is that in Illinois? That's in uh, uh, Lafayette, Indiana. And the dates of that uh, fluctuate uh, uh, on account of uh, Purdue's football schedule. Mm. You know, and it's a small enough area there where they can't do both of them at the same time. They compete with each other. Uh, matter of fact, Ray Glazner, who is now the president of uh, the Historical Real and Actors Guild, he's not going to be here because he's going there. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's an awesome event. And I've uh, also been on uh, various, I'll call them scouts, through Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, Indiana, uh, and Wisconsin, where we would actually just bring in what we could carry, uh, and it all had to be uh, authentic to the time period we were doing, and we would be out there for four or five days. And when we would first get there at the trailhead, we'd pair up with, say, Mike and I. And I'd empty out all my stuff, and Mike would empty out his, and we'd make sure everything was correct. And then once we got on the trail, mm -hmm. we'd keep it to whatever time period, basically early 1700s, what was, what was going on then. Um, over the years, I was lucky enough at Fort Mitchell, Mackinac, four of us canoed in a birch bark canoe from the mainland over to the island and then back again. And that was quite an experience because going there, the two, that's where Lake Huron and Lake Michigan come together. The lakes were as calm as glass, but coming back, it was a, different it was world. a whole different story. And I mean, we were probably... 40 years old at the time, all of us, and we paddled our butts off to get back. I, I miss places like especially Grand Portage because uh, some of my friends uh, have actual birch bark canoes and we get out on Lake Superior and usually canoe out to uh, what's called a witching tree that's actually grown out of a rock and it's uh, 300 years or more old. But in order to get there, uh, you have to go around what's called Hat Point. That's where the voyagers, when they came in the Grand Portage, they would stop, clean up, change clothes, shave, and then uh, come over to the fort. Well, there's big buoys out there with bells on them. So if you get out now where the real open water is and that bell's ringing, time to turn back because it's not worth it to try something. Well, like and that. those lakes can change so quickly with some wind. Exactly. So uh, I'm anxious to go back there again, and uh, hopefully next year <laughs> yeah. to get back to these places. Um, it was really interesting. The last time I was at, well, the first time in, you know, so far the last at Grand Portage was uh, they were they were finishing up the their project for the year, which is a new birch bark canoe, and and it was really interesting that they they told you that. You had to mix the the pitch and the and the pine tar, right? It, it's to according to the temperature that you're going to be running the canoe in, because because it was if it was too hard to get too brittle and too cold, or if it was too hard too soft in the summer it would melt. So you had it was it was, well, it was quite a science. What was mixed in there was uh, pine pitch and uh, charcoal. The charcoal was put in there. There's couple different thoughts about that, but the charcoal was put in there so you could see where it was, the pitch was. And then uh, added to the pitch, just like you said, Don, uh, bear grease was oh, added that, That's there. right, yeah, yeah. So the amount of bear grease was kind of determined uh, what time of the year it was and what kind of water you were in. So if you're in Lake Superior, which cold. is pretty cold, although the first time I ever went there, uh, like I say, in August, it was super hot out. You couldn't even stand in that water for a while. And uh, now, the last couple of times, you just stand in there all day, so it's warming up. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, that determined how you did that uh, pitch, pitch that, the seams on the canoe. Hmm. Uh, it wasn't, uh, I heard someone say one time that it was used as a glue. It wasn't used as a glue, it was used as a sealant. So it, it, it uh, plugged up the holes because you couldn't get a one piece of bark that would make a, a canoe. You had to piece it together. So an awl was put in there, and then it was stitched together with uh, spruce root. 
few years ago, I was pretty lucky. They were redoing the library in Rome, and they had excavated where they were going to do it. There was a bunch of pine trees there. So I asked, they thought I was nuts, but I asked if I could pull up these roots, and they, they did. And the nice thing about these roots, especially when they're wet or just coming out of the ground, you could tape, take them and start splitting them. And you, and you just like carpentry stuff, you could kind of direct this, that split on, you know, if it's going one way, you start pulling kind of mm -hmm. the other way. Well, when you split that root, one side was flat and the other side was rounded. So that's what was done. Those roots were taken, and that's what these canoes were stitched up with. Mm -hmm. So I made coils of these roots, and then, I, I don't know if I had any, I don't have any in here. And then uh, what I did is they dry and they get brittle, but then before you use them, you want to soak them in water, and then you would do that. One other thing that just crossed my mind is we were talking about the Taylor's uh, uh, goose for pressing uh, clothes. Okay. Our blacksmith here, Ken Archie, just made this for Tom. It's called a spider pan. It has legs on it, looks like a spider. So this was put in a, in a fire or a brazier, which... Uh, it's like a small little grill and you have charcoal in that. And then your, your uh, flat iron or Taylor's goose was put in here and heated up in here and then used, you know. Oh, so they heated that up. Okay. That, yeah, coals were put underneath here. And then this could be used also to heat up your, uh, your uh, Taylor's goose. The goose was the metal one, right? Yes. Okay. That's the what, flat that. irons that are in the uh, house, those were heated up on uh, the stove, the wood stove in there. Okay. Usually you add two of them. While you're using one, as that one cools off, the other one's heated up, take that out, and then just keep switching them. Okay. And like I said, uh, you know, all of these different things have gone on. I've also gone in through the boundary waters for two weeks, dressed in the uh, first time I went there, I was dressed like everybody else. The second time I went, I thought, I'm going to give this a try, dressing in moccasins and the clothes that I normally wear here. I did bring a pair of hiking boots with me just in case, but I, I lasted the whole two weeks in what I just had on. Now, that being said, uh, to do this in four seasons of the year, <laughs> Maybe not. you know, especially with moccasins on, uh, there's just a proper way of, walk, of uh, walking through the woods. You're gonna, I don't care what you put on moccasins, you're still gonna get wet feet. Hmm. So uh, in a place like, an outpost like this, uh, there was a couple different things. You would've had moccasins on, you would've had wooden shoes. French had wooden shoes, English had them, and there's different styles of them. Uh, so in the, when you were in a cabin, you might've had your moccasins on walking around, and when, if it was wet outside, you'd put your, uh, uh, you'd keep your moccasins on, and then you'd slide them into your wooden, wooden shoes. shoes. And the wooden shoes actually, uh, I mean, when we were growing up, the word was galoshes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, a wooden shoe with a top to it was called a galosh. So the top uh, holes were poked in, uh, all around a wooden shoe, and then uh, a leather piece was sewn with wire around the top of that shoe. Like spats? The, like spats? Well, like, no, yeah, well, kind of, but it was attached to the shoe okay. with this wire. So you had your holes that were burned or drilled in there with a gimlet. And then uh, in between the holes, it was like um, gouged out a little bit. So when you sewed it with the wire, the wire fit in that, in that gouge. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they, those came in handy. Now, you have to get used to wearing wooden shoes because they'll eat up. I mean, it's it's kind of hard to get used to that. Certainly don't want to use them on a hard surface. <laughs> no. There's no give. Right. And then, of course, uh, buckle shoes. A lot of shoes didn't have a buckle on them like this. They just were had a, a piece of uh, leather thong that was used like a shoelace. So a couple holes were tied in the top, and they were tied off that way. Uh, the thing with these uh, buckle shoes... They were made on a straight last. 
So your right foot and your left foot were the same. Interesting. After a while, you know, you, they kind of adapted to that. Uh, so. I think we covered it pretty good, Joe, and I thank you for being on the Historic Point Boss Update. My and, honor. Yeah, and, uh, and everybody hopefully look forward to that time with the Trekkers and, uh, on the October... Uh, the weekend of October 8th. 8th. So uh, suggest for the public to probably come on Saturday or Sunday between 10 and 5 on, on Saturday and 10 and 4 on Sunday. Weather permitting, of course, uh, the school kids will be here on Friday afternoon. So thank right. you very much, Joe. Okay, thank, thank you. you.